And now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Kelly Lambert. We've been very lucky to have Kelly present at some of our face-to-face -face seminars in the past and now have her here online this evening. And this allows us to reach a greater number of people in our community. So we're very grateful to her. Dr. Kelly Lambert is an advanced accredited practicing dietitian who has more than two decades of experience as a specialist renal dietitian, as well as a doctorate investigating health literacy and cognitive impairment in end stage kidney disease. Kelly's research interests and values are targeted at supporting people with kidney disease to live better lives and improving patient education by health professionals for patients. And as some of you may be aware, she's currently developing a recipe book for people living with PKD. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Charmaine. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to talk. Uh, I'm looking forward to sharing some things with people tonight. Um, thank you to those of you that sent through uh, questions for me, because uh, I've made sure to try and answer as many of those as possible. Now, uh, before I start the presentation, I just wanted to reassure everyone that's uh, in the audience, or perhaps are listening to this after the event, that the slides will be made available um, uh, through PKD Australia. So you're very welcome to um, contact them and obtain a copy so that you don't have to scribble furiously and make notes if that's the sort of person that you are. So you, you really will be able to get the uh, information tonight in a form that you can uh, look at after the event. So I guess without further ado, let me share my screen with you so that we can um, start the presentation. So um, I really like talking about of diet, obviously, when you have uh, a background as a dietitian. But what I really like to do is to provide patients and people with practical information. So I'm hoping that tonight you'll come away with a few practical tips about what diet you need to follow for PKD and a few uh, misconceptions may be myth busted for you. So when um, we were doing some research earlier this year, um, and you may have been one of the people that perhaps participated in an online survey that we put to PKD Australia and to the international PKD support groups, we wanted to find out what sort of information people were seeking when they were looking online. And one of the comments that came up was there's so much conflicting information about diet and PKD, what is the right approach? Well, hopefully tonight you'll, you'll walk away knowing what the right approach is. And if you are feeling confused, this was um, one of the uh, results uh, that we came across and that was that you're not alone. So when we asked people what they were looking for online, 83.7% of the respondents actually said it was information about diet. And that actually was um, exceeding the number of people looking for information on symptom management and medications and doctors. So diet really is a topic of interest to people. So the presentation tonight will actually cover what diet you need to follow and why, what you need to avoid and why. We'll talk about some of the common questions that I get about um, various uh, dietary aspects for PKD and I'll point you in the right direction for where to get some more information. So without further ado, let's start with the basics. Now, I know some of the people in the audience tonight are, are very newly diagnosed and they may not have had uh, information explained to them before about what's actually happening when you have PKD. So for most of you, you, you are aware that PKD results in damaged kidneys, but you may not necessarily know what's going on internally. And the damage that occurs in PKD when the cysts grow is that they're actually destroying normal kidney tissue. And therefore, your result is that you have less filtering units within the kidney. Now, this actually has an impact on your dietary prescription. And if there was one message that I would like to convey to people tonight, that is we need to change our diet over time. And that's because it's reflecting the change in the damage to the kidney. So we measure the damage to the kidneys using a blood test called the estimated glomerular filtration rate. And a good way to think about this is that it's roughly equivalent to your percentage kidney function. And we categorize your kidney function into five stages using this blood test, your eGFR. So when you go away to the doctor next time, I would actually ask them what your eGFR is so that you can gauge what stage of kidney disease you're at, because then you'll have a really good ballpark for what sort of diet you need to be following. 
So what does knowing your stage of kidney disease have to do with what you eat? Well, as I sort of indicated before, the dietary recommendations are based on the stage of kidney disease and the damage to the kidney. The dietary prescription will change over time. So what you have when you first were diagnosed, uh, perhaps when your kidneys were working quite well, needs to be very different from when you perhaps re reach the later stages and you have quite severe damage. So knowing what stage of kidney disease you have is important, especially if you're looking for dietary information. You need to be able to tell if it's applicable to you and if it states a stage of kidney disease. So just to recap, there are five stages. The first stage refers to when you have kidney damage uh, and normal kidney function. So generally the number you would see reported would look like you've got greater than 90 mils per minute of filtering function. As you move through the stages of kidney disease from stage one down to stage 3A, the purpose of the diet is to control risk factors and prevent disease progression. And I will explain a little bit later in this presentation what those elements are that we need to do to control the risk factors and prevent disease progression. Once we get to 45% uh, or thereabouts kidney function, so we reach stage 3B, the role of diet actually changes. And when we reach this stage, it's about symptom control and the dietary prescription starts to get quite different. If we get to the point of kidney failure where you have less than 15% kidney function, what we're doing there is symptom control as well as if you were to start dialysis, it would be about managing the side effects of that treatment. And again, your diet needs to be different. So just to recap, there's three main elements that we think about when we're talking about the diet for PKD. One of, it, one of them is controlling risk factors. If you've got uh, moderate to severe damage, it's about symptom control. And if you've got kidney failure, it's about symptom control and side effects of treatment. You don't wanna start restricting things in your diet too early because it will be unnecessary. So if you had to walk away tonight and try and describe in one sentence what diet you need to follow, I think this is one of the key slides. So if your kidney function falls in the range of stage one to stage 3A, or you've had a transplant, you need to follow a general healthy diet that's in accordance with the Australian guideline to healthy eating or a Mediterranean dietary pattern. It also needs to be reduced in salt. Notice that I'm not saying salt free because that makes life very boring and it's not necessary. And you need to have adequate fluid. And when we talk about fluid in this case, it's about drinking to thirst. I'm not going to say you need to drink three liters a day because not everybody needs to drink that. It's making sure that you're drinking so that you're not thirsty any longer. As we move along to stage 3B to five, the dietary prescription changes. And what the diet is, is one that's reduced in protein, reduced in salt and phosphate, with modifications to fluid and potassium. And that last part is generally individualized. And you may not need to have it if you're not having symptoms. So for example, if you've never had a high potassium, you may not necessarily need to start that restriction until quite late in the piece. So don't start restricting those things unless you've been advised that you need to. You can still make sure that you can have adequate fruits and vegetables, breads and cereals, but the food groups that need to be reduced at this stage are meat and alternatives to meat, such as fish and chicken and eggs and legumes, and dairy products and the appropriate substitutes for uh, dairy products. Moving on, if you are undertaking dialysis, the dietary prescription is slightly different and the diet needs to be high in protein. So there's a contrast there. You need extra protein if you're undertaking dialysis, but the common features there are that it is also low in salt, low in phosphate, modified for fluid and potassium. But again, we still suggest people have adequate fruit, veggies, breads and cereal, and again, it's reduced in meat and dairy. So I'm going to help translate this into foods. So if you're in the early stages of kidney disease, stage one and three, or you've had a transplant, this is the sorts of things you should be putting So fruit and 
the jest is a serve is what you can end. So a large banana, for example, might actually be two serves of fruit. We want you to consume two and a half cups of veggies a day or about five handfuls of vegetables. Any vegetables are good at this point. We want you to consume four to six serves of breads and cereals with a serve being about a slice of bread or about half a cup of rice. We want you to have a palm sized portion of meat. And yes, it does vary. So if you're a large man with a large hand, that's your palm size. But if you're a small lady, then you would need your palm size, which would be quite small. It can be meat, chicken, fish. It can be a couple of eggs. It can be a serve of legumes such as baked beans or lentils or chickpeas. But what we're emphasizing there is a small portion. So a portion that's roughly about the size of a deck of cards would be a good guide. And if you're a large man, maybe slightly bigger. We want you to consume three to four serves of dairy products. So if you don't drink cow's milk, you could have appropriate substitutes like soy milk or uh, rice milk, as long as they're enriched with calcium. It could be a piece of cheese instead, which is roughly the size of a matchbox. We want you to drink fluid, ideally water, every day. And the reason for that is that it actually helps reduce the concentration of solutes salts that your kidney actually has to uh, filter and we want you to make sure that you don't add salt at the table and that you follow the rules that I'll describe later in the program for you. Moving on to the next stage so if you get to 45 percent kidney function or less this is where the same sort of dietary pattern applies in some senses so we still want you to have two pieces of fruit and two and a half cups of veggies have some breads and cereals but what we may need to be doing now is actually emphasizing the, the, the versions that are low and moderate in potassium and if you are following a, a low potassium diet, you still need to have fruit and veggies every day. You'd just be choosing different um, selections. There, there would be some restrictions. We still want you to have a small portion, but it's actually smaller than a deck of cards now. It's actually a little bit less than that. And the main change is that we restrict dairy products at this point to around one serve, so around one cup of milk per day. If you have milk, you shouldn't really have cheese in the same day. And for most people who reach these stages, they're starting to accumulate fluid on their limbs. And so a fluid restriction at this point is quite common. We don't want you to be drinking lots and lots of fluid because your kidneys at this point don't have the capacity to handle all that. And we still want you to have a reduced salt diet and don't add salt table. Moving on to the final um, part, which is if you're undertaking dialysis. Now, the major difference between the foods that you choose at this point is that we want to reverse the amount of the portion of the meat. So we're now saying have a large piece of meat or chicken or fish or eggs. And that's to counteract the effect that dialysis has where it accidentally filters out some of the protein that you'd be consuming from foods. So you need extra to make up for that. The same rules apply in terms of dairy, so less than around one serve. A fluid restriction, especially if you're undertaking hemodialysis and making sure you don't overdo it on the salt. So that's the dietary prescription in a few sentences with some examples. But what I wanted to talk about was if there is anything specific to people with PKD that might be different for other people who have kidney disease. The answer is yes. And there are a few things that differ slightly for people with polycystic kidney disease, for example. This thing called osmolar load is very important. And what we're talking about there is concentration of salts. And I guess the best way to think about those would be, they're a bit like substances and, and salts that circulate in your blood. So a high osmolar load means there's lots of, lots of salts and, and substances circulating. And the problem with having a high osmolar load is that we know that it increases citrate. So that's where the recommendation to drink water comes from to osmolar load. So what are the things that contribute to this osmolar load and the concentration of solutes? Well, the answer is animal protein. It contributes a great deal to the urea, which is one of the waste products, as well as the total acid load that needs to be filtered, as well as providing salt and phosphorus. So we know that from other evidence that plant-based diets don't actually have the same effect in terms of osmolar load. So 
we're not suggesting vegetarian diets per se, but we are suggesting that you make sure that you do have a diet that's high in plants. And this is what's happening in a pictorial form when you have a high osmolar diet. So if you have this diet with lots of molecules and substances and salts, it actually um, has to be filtered through the kidneys. And we know that it drives a hormone that actually increases the cyst size in your kidneys. And that will actually um, make the progression and, and worsen your disease. So that's why we want to reduce that osmolar load. So what does this all mean, really? It means that you need to avoid high-protein diets. Absolutely. That increases the concentration of those sol solutes that need to be filtered. And therefore, we need to reduce the total amount of animal protein that we're consuming. So we don't want large serves of meat, chicken and fish. We definitely don't want large serves of dairy products if we can avoid it as well. So as I said before, we don't need to be vegetarian, but we should be eating lots of plants and plant-based products. So this is the sort of diet that we should be following, one that's heavy on the plant-based protein, as well as a variety of fruits and vegetables in a day there. Now, uh, if you are concerned about what fruits and vegetables and what things you should be choosing, I would encourage you to go and see a dietitian where they can individualise the, the prescription for you a little bit further. Moving on to the next point, which is a common question. Is there anything specific to PED that's different? And the same point is that we think that there may be some evidence that ketogenic, ketogenic diets may be beneficial. And this has come from some experimental evidence in mice. Now, let me just explain what a ketogenic diet is first. A ketogenic diet is a diet that's very low in carbohydrate. And by inducing, sorry, by following a diet that's low in carbohydrate, it actually forces your body to burn fat. And by doing that, it generates ketone. And in the case of the study that was um, published, it actually led to a specific ketone called beta-hydroxybutyrate or BHB. And in this particular study, this ketone actually led to reduced cyst growth. And then when they added be to the normal diets of mice, mice that weren't following a ketogenic diet, they found a similar result. So at least in mice, the, the generation of ketones, specifically this BHB, seems to lead to reduced cyst, cyst growth. And we all want this, right? That's a really good thing. What I would potentially caution about is how this may translate were to follow this particular type of ketogenic diet, it would mean no fruit, no breads, no cereals, a very small amount of eating, and a matchbox size piece of meat, very limited vegetables, so essentially salad balls, and lots and lots and lots and lots of fat. I can't emphasize how much fat you would need to consume. So it would be around 90% of meat would have from fruit. Um, now that's the problem. It's actually not sustainable to follow a diet like that in humans. Uh, apart from anything, you'd be highly constipated. So I would caution you about going out there and potentially following ketogenic diets. There are lots of versions of ketogenic uh, And the reason there's lots of versions is because the experimental evidence that has shown some of it is unsustainable to follow. So people have actually bent the rules to try and follow uh, at least in a, in a long-term way. Now, I know that you can also get BHB supplements in health food shops um, and gyms. I would just caution you about purchasing those as well. And the, the reason I'm cautioning you about those is not only do they have BHB, but some of them are also supplemented with extra protein as well as a whole range of other electrolytes, which actually increase the osmolar load. And as I said before, that's really important that we try and reduce that. So at least at this point, experimental evidence doesn't suggest we then translate that directly to humans. It needs more studies to, to see how we could actually apply this um, effect it has. Moving on to the next part. So this is about another study that was done where they showed intermittent fasting had, had some benefit, but it was experimental evidence. 
And the theory that was actually uh, demonstrated to work is that if you deprive the body of glucose, so if you induce fat burning and ketosis, it slows the cyst growth. But the problem is it's only experimental evidence and we're actually unsure about how this works in humans. My hypothesis is that if you actually do intermittent fasting uh, and you eat small frequent snacks, that's potentially better and reduces the osmolar load than if you had large meals three times a day or even twice a day. So at this point, intermittent fasting has not been proven to actually be useful for people with PKD. At this point, it's still theoretical. Moving on to some other things that are specific to PKD, it is about so We do know very clearly that in cells, caffeine actually increases this substance called CAMP. And that's a substance that we know that stimulates and increases cyst growth. So the next obvious step would be, should we restrict in humans? But there's been studies to actually do still make a recommendation that you should restrict caffeine intake to around two regular coffees or less per day, which equates to if you're not a coffee drinker, about four cups of tea or less per day. So at this point, we don't suggest uh, increasing your caffeine intake too much, but rather keep it at reasonable levels. And that's the level that's considered reasonable. Finally, the fifth thing that is particularly important for people with PKD is that you do have an increased risk of developing kidney stones, and in particular, kidney stones that are made from a substance called oxide. And we put the you can actually get specific injury within the kidney from those stones. So one of my act, uh, specific messages that I would like you to take away is to avoid large volume fruits, especially, you know, what's popular now in lots of places is green smoothies and green leafy juice, uh, vegetables made into juices. Uh, plus those because you're actually getting a significant amount of oxalate, which is actually increasing your developing calcium oxalate kidney stones. So don't go juicing away. So what might be the take messages? I've talked about quite a lot of information. Let me try and synthesize that and, and reduce it to some key messages. First one would be eat less animal protein. So small portions, I'm not saying avoid uh, animal protein completely. But we know that we need to eat less portions of them. Um, and reduce osmolar load. So most importantly, the, the easiest way to start reducing your osmolar load is by targeting salt. So not only do you need to read food labels, you need to use them to help guide your choices. Uh, the next so important contribute to salt is actually adding salt at the table. It's not the major contributor, but it does contribute some. And I'll talk about targeting the high salt items that we perhaps might be surprised about. So let me just talk you through how to read a food label appropriately. So in Australia and New Zealand, by law, all food packages have to have this table. And you may not actually know which column to look at, but the answer is look at the per 100 grams column. And the reason you want to look at this column is so that you can actually compare between products and then you're comparing apples with apples. And that's because the serving size column will vary between products. So you're actually not comparing uh, like with like. So you'd look at the per 100 grams column, you would go down the list to sodium. And in this case, it says 280 milligrams of sodium per 100 grams. So what are we looking at to be a good low salt product? Technically, by law, it has to be less than 120 milligrams of sodium to be considered low salt. So in this case, it's not low salt, uh, but it's definitely not high in salt when you think about, for example, some types of cornflakes would be in excess of 1000 milligrams per 100 grams. So I'd um, suggest you start looking at the salt content of the foods that you typically eat at home and have a look at what substitutions you could make to try and reduce salt in those packages wherever you can. My other advice is about adding salt at the table. So most people who've got PKD have generally got the message not to add salt, but sometimes they're often adding different salts as
example. There's also another type of salt that I want you to be super, super cautious about, and I'll show you that now. So all these on the screen here are all in right now across Australia. high in potassium and if you are stage 3b to stage 5 kidney disease they could land you in hospital they would cause arrhythmias and possibly a heart attack so please 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 do not use these products they are dangerous and I would suggest that you never touch them okay you're not doing yourself any favors by using those particular salt however there are some places that you can buy good substitutes from. So if you do need some extra flavor, my favorite place to recommend is a place called Herbie's, which is an online store. That this particular place because they are not only the, do the products taste great or no actually developed a salt substitute which tastes you uh, have a look at this website I would suggest purchasing this as a starting point um, so that you could at least the range of flavors that are available that you so you could sprinkle this salt um, and they've got some fantastic products the next one is a, a flavor that seasoning is dash is seasoning now this is based in America in a number of places in Australia and it's a super um, substitute in terms of flavour. They've got various flavours so this one I think is a spicy one but they're all salt free so you can use these uh, liberally and they cause no problems with your osmolar load or, or your potassium or anything like that. Uh, this was just a screenshot for one of the places that I've purchased it before. And here's another example so if you're interested in putting your own mixes together which I have done before and it can be kind of fun um, this is a good starting point so this is a website um, that's from America and it's based on helping people follow the DASH diet and you may not have heard of DASH diet but it was a, a very specific dietary plan that was given to people with kidney disease to help them slow their aggression uh, in the early stages and one of the uh, major emphasis of this diet is actually reduced salt. So this web page here actually shows you how to put together your own and it's really good. I would recommend people take a, uh, you know, a look at this website in particular. So just moving on, remember I talked about reducing osmolar load. Um, I just wanted to talk about the last part, which is targeting your high salt items. So there was a recent study conducted um, in Australia of the top uh, foods purchased in Australia that contributed to salt intake. And most people would actually say, obviously salty things like chips and crisps and maybe spreads like Vegemite and dips uh, would actually be the biggest contributor to our salt intake. But surprisingly, it wasn't. It was actually the number one um, items on the screen here were things like sausage rolls, ham, bacon, deli, uh, deli meats like Cabanossi, Devon, roast beef, that kind of thing, hot dogs. So if you do consume those foods, you need to know that they're contributing a super whack of salt to your diet. The next biggest contributor was salt from bread. Now I'm not suggesting that you necessarily cut your bread intake down, but maybe you might want to compare the bread that you consume regularly and see if you can find a version that you like to eat that has a little bit less salt or perhaps make your own version of bread and don't add salt to it. The next obvious category for salt is actually sauces and dressings. And this is where looking at the um, nutrition information panel is useful because you can actually choose, for example, reduced salt tomato sauce, reduced salt barbecue sauce, reduced salt dressings and actually make a major impact in terms of your osmolar load. So finally, take home messages, eat two pieces of fruit and five handfuls of veggies every day. Don't overdo the caffeine, don't overdo the alcohol. So a couple of standard drinks per day with a few days of alcohol, no alcohol per week is fine. Don't overdo it on the sugary soft drinks and cordials. There are recommendations generally for people with kidney disease to try and avoid them at all costs where possible. Um, don't try and navigate this field yourself. 
I would encourage you to try and contact your local renal unit or at least start with your nephrologist to put you in contact with a renal dietitian so that they can have a look at your GFR, have a look at your medications and work out what stage you're at so that they can make an individual prescription for you. And finally, if you've never done it before, I would encourage you to actually just record your food intake, your usual food intake for a few days. Um, and the reason I think that that's useful is sometimes you're actually not aware of uh, how much salt, for example, you're consuming or you get a ballpark figure of how much protein and fibre uh, you're actually tracking along with. And that's a useful guide for people to see how well or how not so well they're doing with their diet. And there is a really easy tool you can use and it's called the Easy Diet Diary. And it's a free app that you can download in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and literally what you could do is just record your usual intake for a few days in this diary. And the really cool part about this app, uh, which I'm not being paid to endorse, by the way, is that you can actually track calcium, phosphorus, sodium, potassium, as well as things like protein and carbohydrate and fibre. Um, so all you need to do is download it and then in the settings, just enable the renal options and off you go. And you can even email that through to your dietitian to have a look at your plan if you're um, keen. Now, if you do happen to choose this as an option, what I'd like to tell you today is that the ballpark we're looking for, if you're tracking your sodium, is about 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. So if you are consuming more than that, then you really need to start cutting down. So just to close off, if you wanted to start with a uh, place for some more information, the PKD uh, Foundation in America has some information on their website. And through my association with PKD Australia, we will be trying to put together some more nutrition information for Australian um, folks who have PKD that you have specific information about foods and uh, products that are available in Australia. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you for tuning in this far. If you do wish to contact me, uh, my email is on the screen or you can contact me on Twitter and I'll happily uh, try and answer any questions that you have. So thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so we've got a little bit of time now for some questions. So um, you can type your questions into the question and it's a box at the bottom and thank you everyone for submitting questions uh, ahead of time. So we'll try and um, get through some of your questions and um, I might start. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly, there was just a little bit of buffering issues when you were talking about the potassium um, salt supplements, I think. I'm not sure if you could just recap. Sure, that I'll start with that. Um, so the did you see the shots on the screen of the products that I had put up? Okay, so all of those products are high in potassium and they should be avoided, especially for people who are stage 3B, 4, stage 5, undertaking dialysis. That They could land you in hospital with a heart attack and are potentially fatal. So you must avoid them. They're dangerous. And why is that, Kelly? Because they're uh, dominated by potassium chloride, which is essentially when you consume it in large amounts, it's a lethal injection. It's, it's going to cause a heart arrhythmia. Um, and that's it's super problematic for people who don't have great filtering capacity at the kidneys. I'm going to get rid of that Himalayan rock salt right now. Yeah, get rid of it. <laughs> I shouldn't um, laugh, it's serious, yeah. Yes, yes, I know. I, and I'm sure a lot of people have seen these fancy salts and... Um, and thought they, they would be suitable. Um, and can I just add, just, just to, for example, on that Himalayan pink rock salt, they're not all the same. So some of them have potassium and some of them don't, but in either case, they're all increasing your osmolar load and potentially contributing to a heart arrhythmia and a heart attack. So mm -hmm. it's a good reason not to use them. Um, we've got a couple of questions on um, sodium. Um, we had a question come through about um, just wondering about sodium. Is it the same as salt? And um, they've seen that there's sodium in their magnesium supplements. Um, and yeah. also another one about um, aluminium free bicarb soda um, diluted in water. Can you drink that for your kidneys? So I'm not sure if you can discuss. Those. Yeah, can I, can I talk about the first question, which what is the difference? So, so salt like that you add at the table um, is sodium chloride. 
So when I'm talking about looking at the food labels, we're looking specifically at the sodium component there. Um, but if we were to talk about, uh, say, how many teaspoons of salt you should have in a day added, it's equivalent to about, um, I'm going to say a teaspoon, but everybody's version of a teaspoon is different. It's about five grams of salt or less. Um, hopefully that answers the question. But in either case, what you need to be do doing is reducing sodium. So in regards to the magnesium supplements that you're taking, yes, unfortunately, some of those supplements do contain sodium. So if you have a look on the back, have a look at how much sodium is actually in there. Most of the time, it's generally around 20 milligrams or less. But if you're on six of those a day, that could make a major contribution. Um, so too would be sodium bicarbonate, which is often added to people's medication lists at stage 3B, 4 and 5. Unfortunately, we can't really change it a lot at this point, but we do know that having lots of fruit and veg counteracts the sodium that you're getting from those capsules. Um, can I go back to your other one about the aluminium? What was the question again? Uh, so, um is it safe to take uh, aluminium-free bicarb soda diluted in water to help the kidneys? Uh, it's still contributing sodium, so it will still be a problem. Uh, the aluminium-free part's not the major issue, it's the bicarb itself. And the uh, bicarb has the sodium? It does, it's sodium bicarbonate, yep, unfortunately. And um, we have a couple of questions on uh, juices, so... Uh, is any fruit juice suitable to drink in stage one? And if so, how much would you recommend as a limit? Um, probably about 150, 200 mils a day. And I would, uh, at, in the early stages of kidney disease, you really don't need to worry about the type of fruit or vegetable that's providing, that's put into the juice. It's more towards the middle stages. So stage 3A, 3B, four and five that you really do need to restrict it. And I would suggest probably not having juices at that point anyway. Um, apart from anything, it's contributing oxalate as well as lots of potassium and you just don't need it at those later stages. Hopefully uh, that's answered your question. It, and there is another one in terms of, and I believe this was in um, reference to the oxalates uh, about celery juice. Would that contribute to oxalate? It would, yes, it would, unfortunately, yeah. And um, just another question on how many serves of meat a week is okay? Um, I would start with the best choice first, which is fish. So if you can start by having at least a couple of fish meals a week, particularly fish that is oily, so salmon, mackerel, herring, fantastic choices then probably two or three serves of red meat is fine per week as well as chicken after that uh, or your substitutes so you could have eggs you could have legumes of some kind but generally start with fish try and get two of those in per week and then roughly split it up amongst the other things that's not a problem the reason i'm i'm saying you don't have to avoid red meat is because it still contributes a really good amount of iron and everybody still needs to get their iron so that's that's really important so Three serves, roughly palm size for most people, unless you're getting towards stage three, B, four and five, it needs to be much smaller. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. And someone has written, I am stage three B and taking part in a study where I have to drink two liters of water daily. What do you think about this amount of water intake? Uh, I think that's concerning, but I'm assuming that there's a nephrologist that would be overseeing that. So uh, the best guide would be, are you seeing an increase in your body weight during this study? Are you feeling like you're getting more short of breath? Uh, is your blood, blood pressure increasing? And are you seeing obvious signs that that much fluid is a problem? So are you getting swollen ankles? Um, are you seeing... Uh, your socks leaving marks on your legs, they're all the signs that you're overdoing it with the fluid. Now, for some people, they might, might be able to tolerate it depending on what other conditions they may have, but for others, that would be terribly problematic. So uh, if you're as, in as part of a study, I would run it past the doctor and just make sure they know you've got kidney disease and that you could potentially be, a, it could be a problem for you. Yeah, I think this is referring to the prevent ADPKD water trial okay um, yep. which is so i'm assuming by a nephrologist. exactly yeah 
Uh, we do have another question on um, juice. Is cranberry juice good? And I just wonder if this has been asked because of um, people with PKD can often get urinary tract infections and cranberry is often recommended to... to um, look, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to answer because it, the answer depends on the stage of your kidney disease. So if you were early stage, not a problem. If you were stage 3B, stage 4, stage 5, it could be a problem, particularly um, because it does contribute potassium. Um, and so if you were at those other stages, I would potentially have cranberry capsules instead where you can actually get a greater volume of the actual active ingredient that's doing you good. Um, so without knowing your personal story, I would say the answer depends but don't have litres and litres of it for sure. Um, and the evidence is actually changing about whether cranberries are help, helpful for urinary tract infections. So it's actually showing that it may be less effective than we once thought. Hopefully that answers your question, whoever asked that. Uh, we've got a question about limiting sugar intake and I might join this with another question about um, uh, chocolate as well? Um, I might answer the two of them separately. So yes, chocolate is okay. We'll start with the good one first. Chocolate is okay in stage one and two. Chocolate's not okay stage three, B, four and five. And there's two reasons for that. And that is because it provides potassium and it provides phosphate. So it's delicious. And if you were to have it at those stages, you'd need to take a phosphate binder with it at the same time. It really does provide a lot of extra stuff that you don't necessarily need. But I do understand I couldn't give up chocolate. <laughs> uh, going to the, the sugar question, um, some sugar is okay. I wouldn't say you need to avoid sugar necessarily. If it helps make a meal palatable or a, a dish palatable, go for it. But what we're not suggesting is overdoing it and having, you know, two cups of sugar in every cup of tea that you have and drinking cordials and drinking soft drinks. That's the problem. It's a little bit on your, in your cup of tea, maybe two or three times a day is fine. Having some products with a bit of sugar in them, like for example, yogurt doesn't have to be unsweetened. It contains sugar and that's fine. Um, it's all about not overdoing it at that stage. Yeah. And another question here, uh, if you are anemic, what can you eat instead of red meat, which is usually recommended for anemia? Um, let me just answer, answer this. So you may not be aware, but one of the natural consequences of your kidneys not working is that you produce less of the hormone that makes red blood cells. And that's what makes you anemic is you don't have enough red blood cells. So, if you're anemic, you need to actually differentiate between whether it's just because you don't have a, enough red blood cells. And as I said, that's a natural consequence of kidney failure. And the only way to rectify that is to take a, an injection called erythropoietin. And almost everyone that develops kidney failure should be on EPO or erythropoietin. Iron deficiency anemia is a separate thing. So what that's telling me is that you actually don't have enough iron in those red blood cells. And treatment of iron deficiency anemia differs according to the stage of your kidney disease. So if you were to have iron deficiency anemia in the early stages, you could potentially get iron from legumes. So lentils, nuts, seeds, you can get it from some um, bread products, you can get it from some vegetables, but you need to have a much greater intake of those products and you need to consume those products with a source of vitamin C to enhance your absorption. So for example, having a glass of juice or having some citrus fruit or having some capsicum or tomato with those meals enhances your absorption of iron from foods that, don't, that aren't red meat essentially. So it's a long-winded answer. It, again, it depends on your stage of kidney disease. If it was towards the latter stages and you were suffering from uh, iron deficiency anemia, we may need to give you an iron infusion to build up those stores because it's virtually impossible to replete it with food alone at the later stages of kidney disease. Sorry Thank to give you. you a long answer. Yep. And, and that leads on to a next question about multivitamin supplements um, and if these are okay in the later stages. Um, 
stage 3b sorry this yeah look that that would be okay at that stage we do um have some different recommendations if you were to undertake dialysis. So if you were taking a multivitamin and you were to, to start dialysis, we don't want you to have it the, the day of dialysis beforehand. We, we want you to have it after you've had your dialysis because if it's hemodialysis, it's gonna wash that vitamin out. If you haven't started dialysis, a general multivitamin should be fine. I would encourage you to make sure that it has some zinc in it. So not all multivitamins have zinc, uh, but one of the common side effects of having a, a diet long-term um, that's reduced in protein and often the combination of having lots of symptoms that make you feel sick is that you can develop signs of a zinc deficiency. So make sure your vitamin contains some zinc. Um, so yes, it should be okay. You don't need to buy specific ones, although there is a specific one you can buy from Kidney Health Australia and that would be a suitable substitute um, if you were looking for a renal specific vitamin. Don't be concerned about the potassium or sodium in those multivitamins. It's not excessive, it's fine. Thank you. And um, we did have a couple of questions that came in before the webinar about um, putting on weight in PKD. Uh, this, and, and I think this has um, been asked because of the kidneys growing in size and potentially the liver as well. Yeah, that's a really challenging part of PKD. I think the best advice, if I had to sum it up sort of in a few sentences, is small frequent meals. So it might be six to eight times you eat per day. Um, if, if you can manage it, perhaps uh, making sure that the fluids that you do drink contain calories. So rather than taking medications with water, for example, take it with some juice, take it with some milk, take it with some apple puree, take it with some yogurt so that you're actually getting some nutrition at the same time and not filling yourself up at meal times. Um, making sure that you're having lots of fat with your meals because gram for gram, fat is actually going to give you more calories. So for example, if you're going to have toast for breakfast, have your margarine spread thickly and not thin. Uh, if you were going to have some dessert, make sure you top it with a little bit of cream, for example. Um, don't be shy of having extra fats when you're at that point because it's actually more important that you don't become malnourished because you're your health outcomes will be worse if you develop malnutrition. Um, making sure you're not filling up on too many foods that are low in calories, um, such as salads and vegetables, making sure that your, your amount is not excessive. So for example, I saw a lady once who had the exact same problem and she was trying to do all the right things, but her main meal was this massive salad that she had and she didn't add any dressing to it and she was just full. She couldn't fit anything else in. Don't be doing that. Cut the size of the um, actual salad down. If you're gonna have it, make sure you have dressings that are based on oil and have extra food with it, like a small portion of meat or some mashed potato that's enriched to help you get those extra calories. Um, I, do, I do suggest, I'm, I'm not trying to push everyone to go and see a dietitian, but that's an example where we could actually give you some renal specific nutrition supplements which are like milkshakes that are safe for people with kidney disease where we could pack in the calories in a small volume for you and that might be a suitable alternative and um, if it's a public hospital dietitian that you're seeing they can get them at cost price rather than retail price so they can get them organized for you that way hopefully that helps whoever asked that question thank you a great answer and um, we also had a question on losing weight in Ooh, this is a challenge. I think uh, reducing portions overall is your starting point. You don't need to have a high carb diet or a low carb diet or a high protein diet or a low protein diet. Overall, it's about the, the total amount of calories. So reducing it by an appropriate amount. And the reason I'm being a little bit gray there is that the actual amount that's appropriate for you differs because um, what we're trying to balance there is avoiding the loss of muscle mass. If you cut your calories too much, you'll have unintentional loss of muscle mass and that can actually lead to a high osmolar load and worsening um, workload for the kidneys and can actually worsen the problem. The other thing is to be as active as you can. Be, get a pedometer, look at how many steps you do every day increase it by 25% or, or as much as you can do and make sure that you're having exercise at an intensity that makes you puff. A, a stroll is not good enough. It needs to be exercise intensity where you're puffing and raising the sweat. 
cyclocross, they do aerobics or run a marathon. If it means walking up a hill that raises a sweat and you're doing a good long walk, that would be suitable, but you need to do it every day to burn those extra calories. The problem with weight loss, particularly when you've got kidney disease that's progressing, is we're trying to balance the benefit of losing weight, which kind of reduces the workload for the kidneys, but if you do it too aggressively, you actually worsen your kidney function. So it's a really fine line. And we don't want people to go off and do overzealous diets that restrict their calories too much because you might actually find that it worsens your kidney function. Um, so it's a challenge. I'm sorry to be kind of general with that answer. Okay, we've, we do have a few questions we might not get time for, but um, we, I just might ask a couple more that yep, we had. Yeah, go for it. Um, we had a couple of people ask about alcohol. Uh, what do they want to know specifically? Uh, is any amount okay or uh, <laughs> is it something that should uh, be in, in, taken in moderation? No, you don't need to avoid. And um, look, a, a moderate amount would be the standard amounts that we recommend. So about 100 to 150 mils of wine. Uh, light beer is better. A couple of you know light beers a week is fine. A couple of days a week. Um, the reason I'm sort of, uh, again, struggling to give a specific answer is that the answer depends. So if you were stage four, for example, alcohol is fine generally, but there are some types of alcohol that have more potassium than others. So for example, a Guinness would be a problem because it has lots more potassium. So we wouldn't suggest you have that, but maybe you'd have a different light beer instead, for example. Uh, but don't feel that you need to avoid it, but just be aware that it does increase osmolar load again. Um, because your kidneys have to filter all of that out. Um, so do enjoy it, but don't overdo it. Again, everything in moderation. Thank you. And um, I might just, the last question I'm going to ask um, from the audience is uh, about turmeric supplements. Um, I wouldn't waste my money. Turmeric. Yeah, look, I wouldn't waste my money with them. There's no evidence that it actually provides any benefit at all in CKD or polycystic kidney disease. So if you want to get the best bang for your buck, honestly, increase your fruit and increase your vegetable intake. It's the best thing you could do for your kidney function without a doubt, followed by reduce your protein, followed by reduce your salt in that order specifically. Um, there are just so many benefits to increasing your fruit and veg. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, I did Thanks. see a question just there. I just wanted to go back to it. Uh, the food recording app was called Easy Diet Diary. Um, and I wanted to just go back to that one at the top of the screen, which is, do you have to have a vegetarian diet during the early stages? Um, you don't have to, but it's certainly beneficial if you did, or you ate vegetarian a couple of days a week that the more plant-based eating you can do, the better it is for your kidneys, absolutely. Uh, and every day a new study comes out extolling the, the virtues of plant-based diets for people with kidney disease. So you just can't get enough. Um, and literally last week, some new guidelines were released globally for the dietary management of kidney disease. And the one thing that they've got in there that they're emphasizing now is plant-based plant -based protein, eat more plants generally, um, you, you can't do enough of them really. Uh, but just be cautious if you get to stage three B and four to actually talk to a dietitian about what would be good choices. Thank you. And if, and if people did want to see a dietitian, uh, how would you recommend they go about, like, do you need a referral or who do you speak to? Uh, no, you don't need a referral necessarily. So um, if you are under the care of a nephrologist, almost every public hospital nephrologist in Australia can access a renal dietitian. Um, and I would access them that way. You're not going to be able to Google them because public hospital renal dietitians aren't advertised. If you were to see a private dietitian, you could actually uh, go to the Dietitians Association of Australia webpage and find a private practice dietitian near you. Um, but I think the feedback I get from people that, and, and this is no criticism of private practice dietitians, it's just it's actually helpful to have access to your history and your pathology, which is why I'd suggest being in partnership with your nephrologist and the dietitian that they know so that they can actually exchange notes about things um, and where you're at and what, what's going on with you. It's actually much more helpful to have access in that way. Um, so if it was a private dietitian, you don't need a referral. Um, sometimes it's actually covered under your private health insurance, so you will get a rebate. Um, 
uh, be cautious about seeing people who call themselves nutritionists because they're not always qualified to give and they shouldn't be giving individual advice. It's actually outside of their scope of practice. And I would advise against naturopaths for the same reason. It's, this is a disease that's too sophisticated and, and it's against uh, the scope of practice of naturopaths anyway. So there's my word of warning. Thank you so much, Kelly. And um, we will be looking to uh, answer any questions that we missed. Um, you can send them through to admin at pkdaustralia.org and um, we'll chat with Kelly. And um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very informative. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for tuning in.